Hey there, I'm your imaginary friend. I have another story for you. Uh, this is by Algernon Blackwood. Now, always, as always, bear in mind that uh, sometimes an author will have included something in their work that at the time of writing seemed fine to them, and it's not always fine. Uh, in particular, this has some gratuitous racism sprinkled throughout it for some reason. bears nothing, uh, no, no bearing on the plot whatsoever. Um, and also, uh, veers pretty close to to uh, describing suicidal ideation, if that is something that you're sensitive to. This is called the Wendigo. Now, you may have heard that word pronounced Wendigo, which would be correct if the word were Spanish in origin, which it is not. Wendigo. A considerable number of hunting parties were out that year without finding so much as a fresh trail, for the moose were uncommonly shy and the various Nimrods returned to the bosoms of their respective families with the best excuses the facts of their imaginations could suggest. Dr. Cathcart, among others, came back without a trophy, but he brought back instead the memory of an experience which he declares was worth all the bull moose that had ever been shot. But then Cathcart of Aberdeen was interested in other things besides moose, among them the vagaries of the human mind. This particular story, however, found no mention in his book on collective hallucination, for the simple reason, so he confided once to a fellow colleague, that he himself played too intimate a part in it to form a competent judgment of the affair as a whole. Besides himself and his guide, Hank Davis, there was young Simpson, his nephew, a divinity student destined for the wee Kirk, then on his first visit to, to Canadian backwoods, and the latter's guide, Defago, Joseph Defago, was a French Canuck who had strayed from his native province of Quebec years before and had got caught in rat portage when the Canadian Pacific Railway was a building. A man who, in addition to his unparalleled knowledge of woodcraft and bush lore, could also sing the old voyageur songs and tell a capital hunting yarn into the bargain. He was deeply susceptible, moreover, to that singular spell which the wilderness lays upon certain lonely natures and he loved the wild solitudes with a kind of romantic passion that amounted almost to an obsession. The life of the backwoods fascinated him, whence doubtless his surpassing efficiency in dealing with their mysteries. On this particular expedition, he was Hank's choice. Hank knew him and swore by him. He also swore at him, just as his pal might. And since he had a vocabulary of picturesque, if utterly meaningless, oaths, the conversation between the two stalwart and hardy woodsmen was often of a rather lively description. This river of expletives, however, Hank agreed to damn a little out of respect for his old hunting boss, Dr. Cathcart, whom, of course, he addressed after the fashion of the country as Doc, and also because he understood that young Simpson was already a bit of a parson. He had, however, one objection to Defago, and one only, which was that the French-Canadian sometimes exhibited what Hank described as the output of a cursed and dismal mind, meaning apparently that he sometimes was true to type, Latin type, and suffered fits of a kind of silent moroseness when nothing could induce him to utter speech. Defago, that is to say, was imaginative and melancholy, and as a rule it was too long a spell of civilization that induced the attacks, for a few days of the wilderness invariably cured them. This, then, was the party of four that found themselves in camp the last week of, in October in that shy moose year, way up in the wilderness north of Rat Portage, a forsaken and desolate country. There was also Punk, an Indian, who had accompanied Dr. Cathcart and Hank on their hunting trips in previous years, and who acted as cook. His duty was merely to stay in camp, catch fish, and prepare venison steaks and coffee at a few minutes' notice. He dressed in the worn-out clothes bequeathed to him by former patrons, and except for his coarse black hair and dark skin, he looked in these city garments no more like a real redskin than a stage negro looks like a real African. For all that, however, Punk had in him still the instincts of his dying race. His taciturn silence and his endurance survived, also his superstition. The party round the blazing fire that night were despondent, for a week had passed without a single sign of recent moose discovering itself. Defago had sung his song and plunged into a story, but Hank, in bad humor, reminded him so often that he kept mussing up the facts so that it was most all nothing but a petered-out lie that the Frenchman had 
finally subsided into a sulky silence, which nothing seemed likely to break. Dr. Cathcart and his nephew were fairly done after an exhausting day. Punk was washing up the dishes, grunting to himself under the lean-to of branches, where he later also slept. No one troubled to stir the slowly dying fire. Overhead the stars were brilliant in a sky quite wintry, and there was so little wind that ice was already forming stealthily along the shores of the still lake behind them. The silence of the vast, listening forest stole forward and enveloped them. Hank broke in suddenly with his nasal voice. "'I'm in favor of breaking new ground tomorrow, Doc,' he observed with energy, looking across at his employer. "'We don't stand a dead Dago's chance around here.' "'Agreed,' said Cathcart, always a man of few words. "'Think the idea is good.' "'Sure, Pop, it's good,' Hank resumed with confidence. "'Suppose now you and I strike west, up Garden Lakeway for a change. "'None of us ain't touched that quite a quiet bit of land yet.' I'm with you. And you, DeFago, take Mr. Simpson along in the small canoe. Skip along across the lake, portage over into Fifty Island water. Take a good squint down that there southern shore. The moose yarded there like hell last year, and for all we know, they may be doing it again this year, just to spite us. DeFago, keeping his eyes on the fire, said nothing by way of reply. He was still offended, possibly, about his interrupted story. No one's been up that way this year, and I'll lay my bottom dollar on that, Hank added with emphasis, as though he had a reason for knowing. He looked over at his partner sharply. Better take the little silk tent and stay away a couple of nights, he concluded, as though the matter were definitely settled, for Hank was recognized as general organizer of the hunt and in charge of the party. It was obvious to anyone that DeFago did not jump at the plan, but his silence seemed to convey something more than ordinary disapproval, and across his sensitive dark face there passed a curious expression, like a flash of firelight, not so quickly, however, that the three men had not time to catch it. He funked for some reason, I thought, Simpson said afterwards in the tent he shared with his uncle. Dr. Cathcart made no immediate re reply, although the look had interested him enough at the time to make a mental note of it. The expression had caused him a passing uneasiness that he could not quite account for at the moment. But Hank, of course, had been the first to notice it, and the odd thing was that, instead of becoming explosive or angry over the other's reluctance, he at once began to humor him a bit. Oh, I've lost my place. My goodness. There it is. Sorry. But there ain't no special reason why no one's been up there this year, he said, with a perceptible hush in his tone. Not the reason you mean, anyway. Last year, it was the fires that kept folks out, and this year, I guess, <laughs> I guess it just happened so, that's all. His manner was clearly meant to be encouraging. Joseph DeFago raised his eyes a moment, then dropped them again. A breath of wind stole out of the forest and stirred the embers into a passing blaze. Dr. Cathcart again noticed the expression in the guide's face. And again he did not like it, but this time the nature of the look betrayed itself. In those eyes, for an instant, he caught the gleam of a man scared in his very soul. It disquieted him more than he cared to admit. "'Bad Indians up that way?' he asked with a laugh to ease matters a little, while Simpson, too sleepy to notice that this subtle by-play, moved off to bed with a prodigious yawn. "'Or, or, anything wrong with the country?' he added, when his nephew was out of hearing. Hank met his eye with something less than his usual frankness. "'He's just scared,' he replied good-humouredly. "'Scared stiff about some old fiery tale. That's all, ain't it, old pard?' He gave DeFago a friendly kick on the moccasined foot that lay nearest the fire. DeFago looked up quickly, as if from an interrupted reverie, a reverie, however, that had not prevented his seeing all that went on about him. "'Scared nothing,' he answered with a flush of defiance. "'There's nothing in the bush that can scare Joseph DeFago, and don't you forget it.' And the natural energy with which he spoke made it impossible to know whether he told the whole truth, or only a part of it. Hank turned towards the doctor. He was just going to add something when he stopped abruptly and looked around. A sound close behind them in the darkness made all three start. It was old Punk, who had moved up from his lean-to while they talked, and now stood there just beyond the circle of firelight listening.
Another time, Doc, Hank whispered with a wink, when the gallery ain't stepped down into the stalls. And springing to his feet, he slapped the Indian on the back and cried noisily, Come up to the fire and warm your dirty red skin a bit. He dragged him toward the blaze and threw more wood on. That was a mighty good feed you give us an hour or two back, he continued heartily, as though to set the man's thoughts on another scent. And it ain't Christian to let you stand out there freezing your old soul to hell while we're getting all good and toasted. Punk moved in and warmed his feet, smiling darkly at the other's volubility, which he only half understood, but saying nothing. And presently Dr. Cathcart, seeing that further conversation was impossible, followed his nephew's example and moved off to the tent, leaving the three men smoking over the now blazing fire. It's not easy to undress in a small tent without waking one's companion, and Cathcart, hardened and warm-blooded as he was in spite of his fifty-odd years, did what Hank would have described as considerable of his twilight in the open. He noticed during the process that Punk had meanwhile gone back to his lean-to, and that Hank and DeFago were at it hammer and tongs, or rather hammer and anvil, the little French-Canadian being the anvil. It was all very like the conventional stage picture of Western melodrama, the fire lighting up their faces with patches of alternate red and black, DeFago in slouch hat and moccasins, and the part of the Badlands villain. Hank, open-faced and hatless, with that reckless fling of his shoulders, the honest and deceived hero, an old punk eavesdropping in the background, supplying the atmosphere of mystery. The doctor smiled as he noticed the details, but at the same time something deep within him, he hardly knew what, shrank a little, as though an almost imperceptible breath of warning had touched the surface of his soul and was gone again before he could seize it. Probably it was traceable to that scared expression he had seen in the eyes of DeFago. Probably, for this hint of fugitive emotion otherwise escaped his usually so keen analysis. DeFago, he was vaguely aware, might cause trouble somehow. He was not as steady a guide as Hank, for instance. Further than that, he could not get. He watched the men a moment longer before diving into the stuffy tent where Simpson already slept soundly. Hank, he saw, was swearing like a mad African in a New York nigger saloon. But it was the swearing of affection. The ridiculous oaths flew freely now that the cause of their obstruction was asleep. Presently he put his arm almost tenderly upon his comrade's shoulder, and they moved off together into the shadows, where their tent stood faintly glimmering. Punk, too, a moment later, followed their example and disappeared between his odorous blankets in the opposite direction. Dr. Cathcart then likewise turned in, weariness and sleep still fighting in his mind with an obscure curiosity to know what it was that had scared DeFago about the country up Fifty Island Waterway, wondering, too, why Punk's presence had prevented the completion of what Hank had to say. Then sleep overtook him. He would know tomorrow. Hank would tell him the story while they trudged after the elusive moose. Deep silence fell about the little camp, planted there so audaciously in the jaws of the wilderness— the lake gleamed like a sheet of black glass beneath the stars. The cold air pricked in the draughts of night that poured their silent tide from the depths of the forest with messages from distant ridges and from lakes just beginning to freeze. There lay already the faint, bleak odors of coming winter. White men with their dull scent might never have divined them. The fragrance of the wood fire would have concealed them from these almost electric hints of moss and bark in a hardening swamp a hundred miles away. Even Hank and DeFago, subtly in league with the soul of the woods as they were, would probably have spread their delicate nostrils in vain. But an hour later, when all slept like the dead, old Punk crept from his blankets and went down to the shore of the lake like a shadow, silently as only Indian blood could move. He raised his head and looked about him. The thick darkness rendered sight of small avail, but like the animals, he possessed other senses that darkness could not mute. He listened, then sniffed the air. Motionless as a hemlock stem, he stood there. After five minutes again, he lifted his head and sniffed, and yet once again. A tingling of the wonderful nerves that betrayed itself by no outer sign ran through him as he tasted the keen air, and merging his figure into the surrounding blackness in a way that only wild men and animals understand. He turned, still moving like a shadow, and went stealthily back to his lean-to in his bed. And soon after, he slept. <clears throat> the change of wind had divined 
he had divined stirred gently the reflection of the stars within the lake. Rising among the far ridges of the country beyond Fifty Island Water, it came from the direction in which he had stared, and it passed over the sleeping camp with a faint and sighing murmur through the tops of the big trees that was almost too delicate to be audible. With it, down the desert paths of night, though too faint, too high even for the Indians' hair-like nerves, there passed a curious thin odor, strangely disquieting, and an odor of something that seemed unfamiliar, utterly unknown. The French-Canadian and the man of Indian blood each stirred uneasily in his sleep just about this time, though neither of them woke. Then the ghost of that unforgettably strange odor passed away and was lost among the leagues of tenantless forest beyond. <clears throat> In the morning, the camp was astir before the sun. There had been a light fall of snow during the night, and the air was sharp. Punk had done his duty betimes, for the odors of coffee and fried bacon reached every tent. All were in good spirits. "'Winds shifted!' cried Hank vigorously, watching Simpson and his guide already loading the small canoe. "'It's across the lake. Dead right for you, fellows. And the snow will make bully trails. If there's any moose mussing around up there, they'll not get so much as a tail-end scent of you with the wind as it is. "'Good luck, Monsieur de Fago,' he ended, added, facetiously giving the name its French pronunciation for once. "'Bon chance!' Defago returned the good wishes, apparently in the best of spirits, the silent mood gone. Before eight o'clock, old Punk had the camp to himself. Cathcart and Hank were far along the trail that led westwards, while the canoe that carried Defago and Simpson, with silk tent and grub for two days, was already a dark speck bobbing on the bosom of the lake, going due east. The wintry sharpness of the air was tempered now by a sun that topped the wooded ridges and blazed with a luxurious warmth upon the world of lake and forest below. Loons flew, skimming through the sparkling spray that the wind lifted. Divers shook their dripping heads to the sun and popped smartly out of, the, out of sight again, and as far as I could reach rose the leagues of endless crowding bush, desolate in its lonely sweep and grandeur, untrodden by foot of man and stretching its mighty and unbroken carpet right up to the frozen shores of Hudson Bay. Simpson, who saw it all for the first time as he paddled hard in the bows of the dancing canoe, was enchanted by its austere beauty. His heart drank in the sense of freedom and great spaces, just as his lungs drank in the cool and perfumed wind. Behind him in the stern seat, singing fragments of his native shanties, Defago steered the craft of birch bark like a thing of life, answering cheerfully all his companions' questions. Both were gay and light-hearted. On such occasions, men lose their superficial worldly distinctions. They become human beings, working together for a common end. Simpson the employer and Defago the employed, among these primitive forces, were simply two men, the, the guider and the guided. Superior knowledge, of course, assumed control, and the younger man fell without a second thought into the quasi-subordinate position. He never dreamed of objecting when Defago dropped the mister and addressed him as, say, Simpson, or Simpson, boss, which was invariably the case before they reached the, the farther shore after a stiff paddle of twenty miles against a headwind. He only laughed and liked it, then ceased to notice it at all. For this divinity student was a young man of parts and character, though as yet, of course, untraveled, and on this trip, the first time he had seen any country but his own, and little Switzerland, this huge scale of things somewhat bewildered him. It was one thing he realized to hear about primeval forests, but quite another to see them. While to dwell in them and seek acquaintance with their wild life was, again, an initiation that no intelligent man could undergo without a certain shifting of personal values hitherto held for permanent and sacred. Simpson knew the first faint indication of this emotion when he held the new three o three rifle in his hands and looked along its pair of faultless gleaming barrels. A three days' journey to their headquarters by lake and portage had carried the process a stage farther, and now that he was about to plunge beyond even the fringe of wilderness where they can't were camped into the virgin heart of uninhabited regions as vast as Europe itself, the true nature of the situation stole upon him with an effect of delight and awe. <clears throat> 
that his imagination was fully capable of appreciating. It was himself and Defago against a multitude, at least against a titan. The bleak splendors of these remote and lonely forests rather overwhelmed him with a sense of his own littleness, that stern quality of the tangled backwoods, which can only be described as merciless and terrible, rose out of these far blue woods swimming upon the horizon and revealed itself. He understood the silent warning. He realized his own utter helplessness. Only Defago, as a symbol of a distant civilization where man was master, stood between him and a pitiless death by exhaustion and starvation. It was thrilling to him, therefore, to watch Defago turn over the canoe upon the shore, pack the paddles carefully underneath, and then proceed to blaze the spruce stems for some distance on either side of an almost invisible trail, with the careless remark thrown in, "'Say, Simpson, if anything happens to me, you'll find the canoe all correct by these marks. Then strike due west into the sun to hit the home camp again, see?' was the most natural thing in the world to say, and he said it without any noticeable inflection of the voice, only it happened to express the youth's emotions at the moment with an utterance that was symbolic of the situation and of his own helplessness as a factor in it. He was alone with Defago in a primitive world. That was all. The canoe, another symbol of man's ascendancy, was now to be left behind. Those small yellow patches made on the trees by the axe were the only indications of its hiding place. Meanwhile, shouldering the packs between them, each man carrying his own rifle, they followed the slender trail over rocks and fallen trunks and across half-frozen swamps, skirting numerous lakes that fairly gemmed the forest, their borders fringed with mist, and towards five o'clock found themselves suddenly on the edge of the woods, looking out across a large sheet of water in front of them, dotted with pine-clad islands of all describable shapes and sizes. Fifty island water, announced Defago wearily. And the son just going to dip his bald old head into it, he added, with unconscious poetry. And immediately they set about pitching camp for the night. In a very few minutes, under those skillful hands that never made a movement too much or a movement too little, the silk tent stood taut and cozy, the beds of balsam boughs ready laid, and a brisk cooking fire burned with the minimum of smoke. While the young Scotchman cleaned the fish that they had caught trolling behind the canoe, Defago Guessed he would just as soon take a turn through the bush for indications of moose. May come across a trunk where they've been and rubbed horns, he said as he moved off, or feeding on the last of the maple leaves. And he was gone. His small figure melted away like a shadow in the dusk, while Simpson noted with a kind of admiration how easily the forest absorbed him into herself. A few steps, it seemed, and he was no longer visible. Yet... There was little underbrush hereabouts. The, the trees stood somewhat apart, well-spaced, and in the clearings grew silver birch and maple, spear-like and slender against the immense stems of spruce and hemlock. But for occasional prostrate monsters and the boulders of grey rock that thrust uncouth shoulders here and there out of the ground, it might well have been a bit of park in the old country. Almost one might have seen in it the hand of man. A little to the right, however, began the great burnt section, miles in extent, proclaiming its real character, Brule, as it is called, where the fires of the previous year had raged for weeks, and the blackened stumps now rose gaunt and ugly, bereft of branches, like gigantic match-heads stuck into the ground, savage and desolate beyond words. The perfume of charcoal and rain-soaked ashes still hung faintly about it. The dusk rapidly deepened, the glades grew dark, the crackling of the fire and the wash of little waves along the rocky lake shore were the only sounds audible. The wind had dropped with the sun, and in all that vast world of branches, nothing stirred. Any moment, it seemed, the woodland gods who were to be worshipped in silence and loneliness might stretch their mighty and terrific outlines among the trees. In front, through doorways pillared by huge straight stems lay the stretch of fifty island water, a crescent-shaped lake some fifteen miles from tip to tip, and perhaps five miles across where they were camped. A sky of rose and saffron, more clear than any atmosphere Simpson had ever known, still dropped its pale streaming fires across the waters, where the islands, a hundred surely, rather than fifty, floated like the fairy barks of some enchanted fleet, fringed with pines whose crests fingered most delicately the sky, they almost seemed to move upward as the light faded, 
about to weigh anchor and navigate the pathways of the heavens instead of the currents of their native and desolate lake. And strips of colored cloud, like flaunting pennons, signaled their departure to the stars. The beauty of the scene was strangely uplifting. Simpson smoked the fish and burnt his fingers into the bargain in his efforts to enjoy it and at the same time tend the frying pan and the fire. Yet ever at the back of his thoughts lay that other aspect of the wilderness, the indifference to human life, the merciless spirit of desolation which took no note of man, the sense of his utter loneliness, now that even Defago had gone, came close as he looked about him and listened for the sound of his companion's returning footsteps. There was pleasure in the sensation, yet with it a perfectly comprehensible alarm, and instinctively the thought stirred in him, what should I do? What could I do if anything happened and he did not come back? They enjoyed their well-earned supper, eating untold quantities of fish and drinking unmilked tea strong enough to kill men who had not covered thirty miles of hard going, eating little on the way. And when it was over, they smoked and told stories round the blazing fire, laughing, stretching weary limbs, and discussing plans for the morrow. Defago was in excellent spirits, though disappointed at having no signs of moose to report. But it was dark, and he had not gone far. The brulee, too, was bad. His clothes and hands were smeared with charcoal. Simpson, watching him, realized with renewed vividness their position, alone together in the wilderness. Defago, he said presently, these woods, you know, are a bit too big to feel quite at home in. To feel comfortable in, I mean. Eh? He merely gave expression to the mood of the moment. He was hardly prepared for the earnestness, the solemnity even, with which the guide took him up. "'You've hit it right, Simpson, boss,' he replied, fixing his searching brown eyes on his face. "'And that's the truth, sure. There's no end to him. No end at all.' Then he added in a lowered tone, as if to himself, "'There's lots found out that, and gone plumb to pieces.' But the man's gravity of manner was not quite to the other's liking. It was a little too suggestive for the scenery and setting. He was sorry he had broached the subject. He remembered suddenly how his uncle had told him that men were sometimes stricken with a strange fever of the wilderness, and the seduction of the uninhabited wastes caught them so fiercely that they went forth, half fascinated, half deluded, to their death. And he had a shrewd idea that his companion held something in sympathy with that queer type. He led the conversation on to other topics, on to Hank and the doctor, for instance, and the natural rivalry as to who should get the first sight of Moose. If they went due west, observed Defago carelessly, there's sixty miles between us now, with old Plunkett halfway house eating himself full to bustin' with fish and coffee. They laughed together over the picture, but the casual mention of those sixty miles again made Simpson realize the prodigious scale of this land where they hunted. Sixty miles was a mere step. Two hundred, little more than a step. Stories of lost hunters rose persistently before his memory. The passion and mystery of homeless and wandering men, seduced by the beauty of great forests, swept his soul in a way too vivid to be quite pleasant. He wondered vaguely whether it was the mood of his companion that invited the unwelcome suggestion with such persistence. "'Sing us a song, Defago, if you're not too tired,' he asked. "'One of those old voyageur songs you sang the other night.' He handed his tobacco pouch to the guide and then filled his own pipe, while the Canadian, nothing loath, sent his light voice across the lake in one of those plaintive, almost melancholy shanties with which lumbermen and trappers lessen the burden of their labor. There was an appealing and romantic flavor about it, something that recalled the atmosphere of the old pioneer days when Indians and wilderness were leagued together, battles frequent in the old country farther off than it is today. The sound traveled pleasantly over the water, but the forest at their back seemed to swallow it down with a single gulp that permitted neither echo nor resistance. Nor resonance, pardon me. It was in the middle of the third verse that Simpson noticed something unusual, something that brought his thoughts back with a rush from faraway scenes. A curious change had come into the man's voice. Even before he knew what it was, uneasiness caught him, and looking up quickly he saw that Defago, though singing, was peering about him into the bush, as though he heard or saw something. His voice grew fainter, dropped to a hush, then ceased altogether. 
The same instant, with a movement amazingly alert, he started to his feet and stood upright, sniffing the air. Like a dog scenting game, he drew the air into his nostrils in short, sharp breaths, turning quickly as he did so in all directions, and finally pointing down the lake shore eastwards. It was a performance unpleasantly suggestive, and at the same time singularly dramatic. Simpson's heart fluttered disagreeably as he watched it. "'Lord, man, how you made me jump!' he exclaimed, on his feet beside him the same instant, and peering over his shoulder into the sea of darkness. "'What's up? Are you frightened?' Even before the question was out of his mind, he knew it was foolish, for any man with a pair of eyes in his head could see that the Canadian had turned white down to his very gills. Not even sunburn in the glare of the fire could hide that. The student felt himself trembling a little, weakish in the knees. What's, what's up? he repeated quickly. Do you smell moose? Or, or anything queer? Anything wrong? He lowered his voice instinctively. The, vo the forest pressed round them with its encircling wall. The, the nearer trees, tree stems gleamed like bronze in the firelight. Beyond that, blackness, and so far as he could tell, a silence of death. Just behind them, a passing puff of wind lifted a single leaf, looked at it, then laid it softly down again without disturbing the rest of the covey. It seemed as if a million invisible causes had combined just to produce that single visible effect. Other life pulsed about them. It was gone. Defago turned abruptly. The livid hue of his face had turned to a dirty gray. I never s said I heard or smelt nothing, he said slowly and emphatically, in an oddly altered voice that conveyed somehow a touch of defiance. I was only taking a look round, so to speak. It's always a mistake to be too previous with your questions. And then he added suddenly, with obvious effort, in his more natural voice, have you got the matches, Boss Simpson? And proceeded to light this, the pipe he had half filled just before he began to sing. Without speaking another word, they sat down again by the fire, Defago changing his side so that he could face the direction the wind came from, for even a tenderfoot could tell that. Defago changed his position in order to hear and smell all there was to be heard and smelt, and since he now faced the lake, with his back to the trees, it was evidently nothing in the forest that had sent so strange and sudden a warning to his marvelously trained nerves. Yes, now I don't feel like singing any, he explained presently of his own accord. That song kind of brings back memories that's troublesome to me. I never ought to have begun it. It sets me on to imagining things, see? Clearly the man was still fighting with some profoundly moving emotion. He wished to excuse himself in the eyes of the other, but the explanation, in that it was only a part of the truth, was a lie, and he knew perfectly well that Simpson was not deceived by it. For nothing could explain away the livid terror that had dropped over his face when, while he stood there sniffing the air, and nothing, and no amount of blazing fire or chatting on ordinary subjects could make that camp exactly as it had seemed before. The shadow of an unknown horror, naked if unguessed, that had flashed for an instant in the face and gestures of the guide, had also communicated itself vaguely and therefore more potently to his companion. The guide's visible efforts to dissemble the truth only made things worse. Moreover, to add to the younger man's uneasiness, was the difficulty, nay the impossibility he felt, of asking questions, and also his complete ignorance as to the cause. Indians, wild animals, forest fires, all these he knew were wholly out of the question. His imagination searched vigorously, but in vain. Yet somehow or other, after another long spell of smoking, talking, and roasting themselves before the great fire, the shadow that had so suddenly invaded their peaceful camp began to shift. Perhaps to Fago's efforts, or the return of his quiet and normal attitude, accomplished this, perhaps... Simpson himself had exaggerated the affair out of all proportion to the truth, or perhaps the vigorous air of the wilderness brought its own powers of healing. Whatever the cause, <clears throat> the feeling of immediate horror seemed to have passed away as mysteriously as it had come, for nothing occurred to feed it. Simpson began to feel that he had permitted himself the unreasoning terror of a child. He put it down partly to a certain subconscious excitement that this wild and immense scenery generated in his blood, partly to the spell of solitude, and partly to over-fatigue. <clears throat>
to that pallor in the guide's face was, of course, uncommonly hard to explain. Yet it might have been due to, in some way to an effect of firelight or his own imagination. He gave it the benefit of the doubt. He was scotch. When a somewhat unordinary emotion has disappeared, the mind always finds a dozen ways of explaining away its causes. Simpson lit a last pipe and tried to laugh to himself. When getting home to Scotland, it would make quite a good story. He did not realize that this laughter was a sign that terror still lurked in the recesses of his soul, that in fact it was merely one of the conventional signs by which a man seriously alarmed tries to persuade himself that he is not so. Defago, however, heard that low laughter and looked up with surprise on his face. The two men stood side by side, kicking the embers about before going to bed. It was ten o'clock, a late hour for hunters to be still awake. "'What's tickler near?' he asked in his ordinary tone, yet gravely. "'I I was thinking of our little toy woods at home just at that moment,' stammered Simpson, coming back to what really dominated his mind, startled by the question, and comparing them to... To, to all this, and he swept his arm round to indicate the bush. A pause followed in which neither of them said anything. All the same, I wouldn't laugh about it if I was you, Defago added, looking over at Simpson's shoulder into the shadows. There's places in there nobody won't never see into. Nobody knows what lives in there either. Too big? Too far off? The suggestion in the guide's manner was immense and horrible. Defago nodded. The expression on his face was dark. He too felt uneasy. The younger man understood that in a hinterland of this size there might well be depths of wood that would never in the life of the world be known or trodden. The thought was not exactly the sort he welcomed. In a loud voice, cheerfully, he suggested that it was time for bed. But the guide lingered, tinkering with the fire, arranging the stones needlessly, doing a dozen things that did not really need doing. Evidently, there was something he wanted to say, yet found it difficult to get at. Say you, Boss Simpson, he began suddenly as the last shower of sparks went up into the air. You don't. Smell nothing, do you? Nothing particular, I mean? The commonplace question, Simpson realized, veiled a dreadfully serious thought in his mind. A shiver ran down his back. Nothing but the burning wood. He replied firmly, kicking at the embers. The sound of his own foot made him start. And all the evening you ain't smelt nothing, persisted the guide, peering at him through the gloom. Nothing extraordinary, different, anything else you ever smelt before? No, no, man. Nothing at all, he replied aggressively, half angrily. Defago's face cleared. That's good. He exclaimed with evident relief. Ah, that's good to hear. Have you? asked Simpson sharply, and the same instant regretted the question. The Canadian came closer in the darkness. He shook his head. Uh, I guess not, he said, though without overwhelming conviction. It must have been just that song of mine that did it. It's the song they sing in lumber camps and God-forsaken places like that, where they're scared the Wendy goes somewhere around, doing a bit of swift traveling. And what's the Wendigo, pray? Simpson asked quickly, irritated, because, again, he could not prevent the sudden shiver of the nerves. He knew that he was close upon the man's terror and the cause of it. Yet a rushing, passionate curiosity overcame his better judgment and his fear. Defago turned swiftly and looked at him as though he were suddenly about to shriek. His eyes shone, but his mouth was wide open. Yet all he said, or, or whispered, rather, for his voice sank very low, was, It was nothing. Nothing but what those lousy fellers believe when they've been hitting the bottle too long. And a sort of great animal that lives up yonder. He jerked his head northwards, quick as lightning in its tracks, and bigger than anything else in the bush, and ain't supposed to be very good to look at, that's all. Uh, backward superstition, began Simpson, moving hastily toward the tent in order to shake off the hand of the guy that clutched his arm. Come, come, hurry up for God's sake and get the lantern going. It's time we were in bed and asleep if we're going to be up with the sun tomorrow. The guide was close on his heels. I'm coming, he answered out of the darkness. I'm coming. And after a slight delay, he appeared with the lantern and hung it from a nail in the front pole of the tent. 
The shadows of a hundred trees shifted their places quickly as he did so, and when he stumbled over the rope, diving swiftly inside, the whole tent trembled as though a gust of wind struck it. The two men lay down, without undressing, upon their beds of soft balsam boughs, cunningly arranged. Inside all was warm and cosy, but outside the world of crowding trees pressed close about them, marshalling their million shadows, and smothering the little tent that stood there like a wee white shell facing the ocean of tremendous forest. Between the two lonely figures within, however, there pressed another shadow that was not a shadow from the night. It was the shadow cast by the strange fear, never wholly exercised, that had leaped suddenly upon Defago in the middle of his singing, and Simpson, as he lay there, watching the darkness through the open flap of the tent, ready to plunge into the fragrant abyss of sleep, knew first that unique and profound stillness of a primeval forest when no wind stirs, and when the night has weight and substance that enters into the soul to bind a veil about it. Then sleep took him. <clears throat> Thus, it seemed to him, at least. Yet it was true that the lap of the water, just beyond the tent door, still beat time with his lessening pulses when he realized that he was lying with his eyes open, and that another sound had recently introduced itself with cunning softness between the splash and murmur of the little waves. And long before he understood what this sound was, it had stirred him in him the centers of pity and alarm. He listened intently, though at first in vain, for the running blood beat all its drums too noisily in his ears. It had come, he wondered, from the lake, or from the woods. And suddenly, with a rush and a flutter of his heart, he knew that it was close beside him in the tent. And when he turned over for a better hearing, it focused itself unmistakably not two feet away. It was a sound of weeping. Defago, upon his bed of branches, was sobbing in the darkness, as though his heart would break. The blankets evidently stuffed against his mouth to stifle it. And his first feeling, before he could think or reflect, was the rush of a poignant and searching tenderness. This intimate human sound, heard amid the desolation about them, woke pity. It was so incongruous, so pitifully incongruous, and so vain, tears, in this vast and cruel wilderness of... Of what a veil! He thought of a little child crying in mid-Atlantic. And, of course, with further realization and the memory of what had gone before, came the descent of the terror upon him, and his blood ran cold. Defago, he whispered quickly. What's the matter? He tried to make his voice very gentle. Are you in pain? Unhappy? There was no reply. But the sounds ceased abruptly. He stretched his hand out and touched him. The body did not stir. Are you awake? For it occurred to him that the man was crying in his sleep. Are you cold? He noticed that his feet, which were uncovered, projected beyond the mouth of the tent. He spread an extra fold of his own blankets over them. The guide had slipped down in his bed, and the branches seemed to have been dragged with him. He was afraid to pull the body back again for fear of waking him. One or two tentative questions he ventured softly, but... Though he waited for several minutes, there came no reply, nor any sign of movement. Presently he heard his regular and quiet breathing, and, putting his hand against again gently on the breast, felt the steady rise and fall beneath. "'Let me know if anything's wrong,' he whispered, "'or if I can do anything. Wake me at once if you feel queer.' He hardly knew what to say. He lay down, thinking and wondering what it all meant. Tvego, of course, had been crying in his sleep. Some dream or other had afflicted him. Yet never in his life would he forget that pitiful sound of sobbing and the feeling that the whole awful wilderness of woods listened. His own mind busied itself for a long time with the recent events, of which this took its mysterious place as one, and though his reasons successfully argued away all unwelcome suggestions, a sensation of uneasiness remained, resisting ejection, very deep-seated, peculiar, beyond ordinary. <clears throat> but sleep in the long run proves greater than all emotions. 
His thoughts soon wandered again. He lay there, warm as toast, exceedingly weary. The night soothed and comforted, blunting the edges of memory and alarm. Half an hour later, he was oblivious of everything in the outer world about him. Yet sleep, in this case, was his great enemy, concealing all approaches, smothering the warning of his nerves. As sometimes in a nightmare, events crowd upon each other's heels with a conviction of dreadfulest reality, yet some inconsistent detail accuses the whole display of incompleteness and disguise, so the events that now followed, though they actually happened, persuaded the mind somehow that the detail which could explain them had been overlooked in the confusion, and that therefore they were but partly true. The rest delusion. At the back of the sleeper's mind, something remains awake, ready to s let slip the judgment. All well, this is not quite real, and when you wake up, you'll understand. And thus, in a way, it was with Simpson. The events, not wholly inexplicable or incredible in themselves, yet remain for the man who saw and heard them a sequence of separate facts of cold horror, because the little piece that might have made the puzzle clear lay concealed or overlooked. So far as he can recall, it was a violent movement running downwards through the tent towards the door that first woke him and made him aware that his companion was sitting bolt upright beside him, quivering. Hours must have passed, for it was the pale gleam of the dawn that revealed his outline against the canvas. This time the man was not crying. He was quaking like a leaf, the trembling he felt plainly through the blankets down the entire length of his own body, DeFago had huddled down against him for protection, shrinking away from something that apparently concealed itself near the door flaps of the little tent. Simpson thereupon called out in a loud voice some question or other. In the first bewilderment of waking, he does not remember exactly what. And the man made no reply. The atmosphere and feeling of true nightmare lay horribly about him, making movement and speech both difficult. At first, indeed, he was not sure where he was, whether in one of the earlier camps or or at home in his bed at Aberdeen. A sense of confusion was very troubling. And next, almost simultaneous with his waking, it seemed, the profound stillness of the dawn outside was shattered by a most uncommon sound. It came without warning or audible approach, and it was unspeakably dreadful. It was a voice, Simpson declares, possibly a human voice, hoarse yet plaintive, a soft, roaring voice close outside the tent, overhead rather than upon the ground, of immense volume, while in some way, some strange way, most penetrating and seductively sweet. It rang out, too, in three separate and distinct notes or cries that bore in some odd fashion a resemblance, far-fetched yet recognizable, to the name of the guide. De Fago. The student admits that he is unable to describe it quite intelligently, for it was unlike any sound he had ever heard in his life, and combined a blending of such contrary qualities, a sort of windy, crying voice, he calls it, as of something lonely and untamed, wild and of abominable power. And even before it ceased, dropping back into the great gulfs of silence, the guide beside him had sprung to his feet with an answering, though unintelligible, cry. He blundered against the tent pole with violence, shaking the whole structure, spreading his arms out frantically for more room, and kicking his legs impetuously free of the clinging blankets. For a second, perhaps two, he stood upright by the door, his outline dark against the pallor of the dawn, then, with a furious rushing speed, before his companion could move a hand to stop him, he shot with a plunge through the flaps of canvas, and was gone. And as he went, so astonishingly fast that the voice could actually be heard dying in the distance, he called aloud in tones of anguished terror that at the same time held something strangely like the frenzied exultation of delight. No! Oh! My feet of fire! My burning feet of fire! Oh! Oh! This height and fiery speed! And then the distance quickly buried it, and the deep silence of very early morning descended upon the forest as before. It had all come about with such rapidity that, but for the evidence of the empty bed beside him, Simpson could almost have believed it to have been the memory of a nightmare carried over from sleep. He still felt the warm pressure of that vanished body against his side. There lay the twisted blankets in a heap. The very tent yet trembled with the vehemence of the impetuous departure. 
Strange words rang in his ears, as though he still heard them in the distance, wild language of a suddenly stricken mind. Moreover, it was not only the senses of sight and hearing that reported uncommon things to his brain, for even while the man cried and ran, he had become aware that a strange perfume, faint yet pungent, pervaded the interior of the tent. And it was at this point, it seems, brought to himself by the consciousness that his nostrils were taking this distressing odor down into his throat, that he found his courage, sprang quickly to his feet, and went out. The gray light of dawn that dropped cold and glimmering between the trees revealed the scene tolerably well. There stood the tent behind him, soaked with dew, the dark ashes of the fire still warm, the lake white beneath a coating of mist, the islands rising darkly out of it like objects packed in wool, and patches of snow beyond among the clearer spaces of the bush, everything cold, still waiting for the sun, but nowhere a sign of the vanished guide, still doubtless flying at frantic speed through the frozen woods. There was not even the sound of disappearing footsteps, nor the echoes of the dying voice. He had gone, utterly. There was nothing, nothing but the sense of his recent presence, so strongly left behind about the camp, and this penetrating, all-pervading odor. And even this was now rapidly disappearing in its turn. In spite of his exceeding mental perturbation, Simpson struggled hard to detect its nature and define it, but the ascertaining of an elusive scent, not recognized subconsciously and at once, is a, a very subtle operation of the mind. And he failed. It was gone before he could properly seize or name it. Approximate description, even, seems to have been difficult, for it was unlike any smell he knew. Acrid, rather, not unlike the odor of a lion, he thinks, yet softer and not wholly unpleasing, with something almost sweet in it that reminded him of the scent of decaying garden leaves, earth, and the, and the myriad nameless perfumes that make up the odor of a big forest. Yet the ogre of lions is the phrase with which he usually sums it all up. Then it was wholly gone, and he found himself standing by the ashes of the fire in a state of amazement and stupid terror that left him the helpless prey of anything that chose to happen. Had a muskrat poked its pointed muzzle over a rock, or a squirrel scuttled in that instant down the bark of a tree, he would most likely have collapsed without more ado and fainted. For he felt about the whole affair the touch of somewhere of a, a great outer horror, and his scattered powers had not as yet had time to collect themselves into a definite attitude of fighting self-control. Nothing did happen, however. A great kiss of wind ran softly through the awakening forest, and a few maple leaves here and there rustled tremblingly to earth. The sky seemed to grow suddenly much lighter. Simpson felt the cool air upon his cheek and uncovered head, realized that he was shivering with the cold, and making a great effort realized next that he was alone in the bush. And... And he was called upon to take immediate steps to find and succor his vanished companion. Making an effort, accordingly, he did, though an ill-calculated and futile one. With that wilderness of trees about him, this sheet of water cutting him off from behind, and the horror of that wild cry in his blood, he did what any other inexperienced man would have done in similar bewilderment. He ran about without any sense of direction, like a frantic child, and called loudly without ceasing the name of the guide. Defago! 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 He yelled, and the trees gave him back the name as often he, as he shouted, only a little softened. Defago! 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 He followed the trail that lay a short distance across the patches of snow, and then lost it again where the trees grew too thickly for snow to lie. He shouted till he was hoarse, until the sound of his own voice in all that unanswering and listening world began to frighten him. His confusion increased in direct ratio to the violence of his efforts. His distress became formidably acute, till at length his exertions defeated their own object, and from sheer exhaustion he headed back to the camp again. It remains a wonder that he ever found his way. It was with great difficulty, and only after numberless false clues, that he at last saw the white tent between the trees, and so reached safety. Exhaustion then applied its own remedy, and he grew calmer. He made the fire and breakfasted. Hot coffee and bacon put a little sense and judgment into him again, and he realized that he had been behaving like a boy, 
we now made another and more successful attempt to face the situation collectively, and a nature naturally plucky coming to his assistance, he decided that he must first make as thorough a search as possible, failing success in which he must find his way into the home camp as best he could and bring help. And this is what he did, taking food, matches, and rifle with him, and a small axe to blaze the trees against his return journey, he set forth. It was eight o'clock when he started, the sun shining over the tops of the trees in a sky without clouds. Pinned to a stake by the fire, he left a note in case DeFago returned while he was away. This time, according to a careful plan, he took a new direction, intending to make a wide sweep that must sooner or later cut into indications of the guide's trail, and before he had gone a quarter of a mile he came across the tracks of a large animal in the snow, and beside it the light and smaller tracks of what were beyond question human feet the feet of Defago. The relief he had once experienced was natural, though brief, for at first sight he saw in these tracks a simple explanation of the whole matter. These big marks had surely been left by a bull moose that, wind against it, had blundered upon the camp and uttered its singular cry of warning and alarm the moment its mistake was apparent. Defago, in whom the hunting instinct was developed to the point of uncanny perfection, had scented the brute coming down the wind hours before. His excitement and disappearance were due, of course, to to his then the impossible explanation at which he grasped faded and his common sense showed him mercilessly that none of this was true no guide much less a guide like defago could have acted in so irrational a way going off even without his rifle the whole affair demanded a far more complicated elucidation when he remembered the details of it all the cry of terror the amazing language the gray face of horror when his nostrils caught the first new odor, that muffled sobbing in the darkness, and and for this too now came back to him dimly the man's original aversion for this particular bit of country. Besides, now that he examined them closer, these were not the tracks of a bull moose at all. Hank had explained to him the outline of a bull's hoofs, or a cow's, or calf's too, for that matter. He had drawn them clearly on a strip of birch bark, and these were wholly different. They were big, round, ample, with no pointed outline as of sharp hooves. He wondered for a moment whether bear tracks were like that. There was no other animal he could think of, for caribou did not come so far south this season, and even if they did, would leave hoof marks. They were ominous signs, these mysterious writings left in the snow by the unknown creature that had lured a human being away from safety, and when he coupled them in his imagination with that haunting sound that broke the stillness of the dawn. A momentary dizziness shook his mind, distressing him again beyond belief. He felt the threatening aspect of it all, and stooping down to examine the marks more closely, he caught a faint whiff of that sweet yet pungent odor that made him instantly straighten up again, fighting a sensation almost of nausea. Then his memory played him another evil trick. He suddenly recalled those uncovered feet projecting beyond the edge of the tent, and the body's appearance of having been dragged toward the opening, the man's shrinking from something by the door when he woke later. The details now beat against his trembling mind with concerted attack. They seemed to gather in those deep spaces of the silent forest about him, where the host of trees stood waiting, listening, watching to see what he would do. The woods were closing round him. The persistence of true pluck, however, Simpson went forward, following the tracks as best he could, smothering these ugly emotions that sought to weaken his will. He blazed innumerable trees as he went, ever fearful of being unable to find the way back, and calling aloud at intervals of a few seconds the name of the guide. The dull tapping of the axe upon the massive trunks and the unnatural accents of his own voice became at length sounds that he even dreaded to make, dreaded to hear, for they drew attention without ceasing to his presence and exact whereabouts, and if it were really the case that something was hunting himself down in the same way that he was hunting down another. With a strong effort, he crushed the thought out the instant it rose. It was the beginning, he realized, of a bewilderment utterly diabolical in kind that would speedily destroy him. Although the snow was not continuous, lying merely in shallow flurries over the more open spaces, he found no difficulty in following the tracks for the first few miles. They went straight as a ruled line wherever the trees permitted, 
The stride soon began to increase in length, till it finally assumed proportions that seemed absolutely impossible for any ordinary animal to have made. Like huge flying leaps they became. One of these he measured, and though he knew that stretch of eighteen feet must be somehow wrong, he was at a complete loss to understand why he found no signs on the snow between the extreme points. But what perplexed him even more, making him feel his vision had gone utterly awry, was that Defago's stride increased in the same manner, and finally covered the same incredible distances. It looked as if the great beast had lifted him with it and carried him across these astonishing intervals. Simpson, who was much longer in the limbs, found that he could not compass even half the stretch by taking a running jump. The sight of these huge tracks running side by side, silent evidence of a dreadful journey in which terror or madness had urged to impossible results, was profoundly moving. It shocked him in the secret depths of his soul. It was the most horrible thing his eyes had ever looked upon. He began to follow them mechanically, absent-mindedly almost, ever peering over his shoulder to see if he, too, were being followed by something with a gigantic tread. And soon it came about that he no longer quite realized what it was they signified, these impressions left upon the snow by something nameless and untamed, always accompanied by the footmarks of the little French-Canadian, his guide, his comrade, the man who had shared his tent a few hours before, chatting, laughing, even singing by his side. For a man of his years and inexperience, <clears throat> only a canny Scot, perhaps grounded in common sense and established in logic, could have preserved even that measure of balance that this youth somehow or other did manage to preserve through the whole adventure. Otherwise, Two things he presently noticed, while foraging pluckily ahead, must have sent him headlong back to the comparative safety of his tent, instead of only making his hands close more tightly upon the rifle stock, while his heart, trained for the wee kirk, sent a wordless prayer winging its way to heaven. Both tracks, he saw, had undergone a change, and this change, so far as it concerned the footsteps of the man, was in some indecipherable way appalling. It was in... The bigger tracks, he first noticed this, and for a long time he could not quite believe his eyes. Was it the blown leaves that produced odd effects of light and shade, or that the, the dry snow, drifting like finely round rice about the edges, cast shadows and highlights? Or was it actually the fact that the great marks had become faintly colored? For round about the deep, plunging holes of the animal, there now appeared a mysterious reddish tinge that was more like an effect of light than of anything that dyed the substance of the snow itself. Every mark had it, and had it increasingly, this indistinct fiery tinge that painted a new touch of ghastliness into the picture. But when un wholly unable to explain or to credit it, he turned his attention to the other tracks to discover if they too bore similar witness. He noticed that these had meanwhile undergone a change that was infinitely worse, and charged with far more horrible suggestion. For in the last hundred yards or so, he saw that they had grown gradually into the semblance of the parent tread. Imperceptibly, the change had come about, yet unmistakably, it was hard to see where the change first began. The result, however, was beyond question. Smaller, neater, more cleanly modeled, they formed now an exact and careful duplicate of the larger tracks beside them. The feet that produced them had, therefore, also changed and something in his mind reared up with loathing and with terror when he saw it. Simpson, for the first time, hesitated, then, ashamed of his alarm and indecision, took a few hurried steps ahead. The next instant stopped dead in his tracks. Immediately in front of him, all signs of the trail ceased. Both tracks came to an abrupt end. On all sides, for a hundred yards and more, he searched in vain for the least indication of their continuance. There was nothing. The trees were very thick just there, big trees, all of them, spruce, cedar, hemlock. There was no underbrush. He stood, looking about him, all distraught, bereft of any power of judgment. Then he set to work to search again, and again, and yet again, but always with the same result, nothing. The feet that printed the surface of the snow thus far had now, apparently, 
left the ground. And it was in that moment of distress and confusion that the whip of terror laid its most nicely calculated lash about his heart. It dropped with deadly effect upon the sorest spot of all, completely unnerving him. He'd been seekingly dreading all the time that it would come, and come it did. Far overhead, muted by great height and distance, strangely thinned and wailing, he heard the crying voice of Defago, the guide. The sound dropped upon him out of that still, wintry sky with an effect of dismay and terror unsurpassed. The rifle fell to his feet. He stood motionless an instant, listening, as it were, with his whole body, and staggered back against the nearest tree for support, disorganized hopelessly in mind and spirit. To him in that moment it seemed the most shattering and dislocating experience he had ever known, so that his heart emptied itself of all feeling whatsoever as by a sudden draft. Oh! Oh, this fiery height! Oh, my feet of fire! My burning feet of fire! Ran in far beseeching accents of indescribable appeal this voice of anguish down the sky. Once it called, then silenced through all the listening wilderness of trees. And Simpson, scarcely knowing what he did, presently found himself running wildly to and fro, searching, calling, tripping over roots and boulders, and flinging himself in a frenzy of undirected pursuit after the caller. Behind the screen of memory and emotion with which experience veils events, he plunged, distracted and half-deranged, picking up false lights like a ship at sea, terror in his eyes and heart and soul, for the panic of the wilderness had called to him in that far voice the power of untamed distance, the enticement of the desolation that destroys... He knew in that moment all the pains of someone hopelessly and irretrievably lost, suffering the lust and travail of a soul in the final loneliness. A vision of Defago, eternally hunted, driven and pursued across the skyey vastness of those ancient forests, fled like a flame across the dark ruin of his thoughts. It seemed ages before he could find anything in the chaos of his disorganized sensations to which he could anchor himself steady for a moment and think... The cry was not repeated. His own hoarse calling brought no response. The inscrutable forces of the wild had summoned their victim beyond recall and held him fast. Yet he searched and called, it seems, for hours afterwards, for it was late in the afternoon when at length he decided to abandon a useless pursuit and return to his camp on the shores of Fifty Island Water. Even then he went with reluctance, that crying voice still echoing in his ears. With difficulty he found his rifle and, his, and the homeward trail, the concentration necessary to follow the badly blazed trees, and a biting hunger that gnawed helped to keep his mind steady. Otherwise, he admits, the temporary aberration he had suffered might have been prolonged to the point of positive disaster. Gradually, the ballast shifted back again, and he regained something that approached his normal equilibrium. But for all that, the journey through the gathering dusk was miserably haunted. He heard innumerable following footsteps, voices that laughed and whispered, and saw figures crouching behind trees and boulders, making signs to one another for a concerted attack the moment he had passed. The creeping murmur of the wind made him start and listen. He went stealthily, trying to hide where possible, and making as little sound as he could. The shadows of the woods hitherto protective or covering merely, had now become menacing, challenging, and the pageantry in his frightened mind masked a host of possibilities that were all the more ominous for being obscure. The presentiment of a nameless doom lurked ill-concealed behind every detail of what had happened. It was really admirable how we emerged victor in the end. Men of riper powers and experience might have come through the ordeal with less success, he had himself tolerably well in hand, all things considered, and his plan of action proves it. Sleeping absolutely out of the question and traveling an unknown trail in the darkness, equally impracticable, he sat up the whole of that night, rifle in hand, before a fire he never for a single moment allowed to die down. The severity of the haunted vigil marked his soul for life, but it was successfully accomplished, and with the very first signs of dawn he set forth upon the long return journey to the home camp to get help. As before, he left a written note to explain his absence, and to indicate where he had left a plentiful cache of food and matches, though he had no expectation that any human hands would find them. 
How Simpson found his way alone by the lake and forest might well make a story in itself, for to hear him tell it is to know the passionless, passionate loneliness of soul that a man can feel when the wilderness holds him in the hollow of its illimitable hand and laughs. It is also to admire his indomitable pluck. He claims no skill, declaring that he followed the almost invisible trail mechanically and without thinking, and this doubtless is the truth. He relied upon the guiding of the unconscious mind, which is instinct. Perhaps, too, some sense of orientation, known to animals and primitive men, may have helped as well, for through all the ta that tangled region he succeeded in re reaching the exact spot where DeFago had hidden the, can the canoe nearly three days before, with the remark, "'Strike due west across the lake into the sun to find the camp.'" There was not much sun left to guide him, but he used his compass to the best of his ability, embarking in the frail craft for the last twelve miles of his journey with a sensation of immense relief that the forest was at last behind him. And fortunately the water was calm. He took his line across the center of the lake instead of coasting round the shores for another twenty miles. Fortunately, too, the other hunters were back. <clears throat> the light of their fires furnished a steering point without which he might have searched all night long for the actual position of the camp. It was close upon midnight, all the same, when his canoe grated on the sandy cove, and Hank, Punk, and his uncle, disturbed in their sleep by his cries, ran quickly down and helped a very exhausted and broken specimen of Scotch humanity over the rocks toward a dying fire. <clears throat> 